I was sitting in my car, staring blankly at the dashboard as the engine idled. The parking lot of General Hospital was nearly empty at this hour, just a few cars scattered here and there under the harsh glow of the streetlights. It was 11.52 p.m., the end of another long night shift in the ER. I've been working as a nurse at General for the past three years. The night shifts are always tough, but this one had been particularly draining. A multi-car pileup on the highway had kept us busy all night, with a steady stream of injuries coming through the doors. Now that things had finally quieted down, all I wanted was to go home and collapse into bed. I took a deep breath and put the car in reverse, slowly backing out of my parking spot. As I drove towards the exit, my phone buzzed with an incoming call. I glanced at the screen and saw it was my best friend and fellow nurse, Tasha. We often carpooled to work, but she had taken her own car tonight since our shifts didn't quite line up. Hey Tasha, what's up? I answered, putting the phone on speaker as I turned onto the main road. Hey Melody, Tasha's voice came through, sounding a bit distracted. I just wanted to let you know I'm taking a different route home tonight. There's some construction on the street that's causing major backups. Oh, thanks for the heads up, I replied. Which way are you going instead? I'm going to cut through that industrial area off of 5th Street, she said. Should be quicker, even if it's a little out of the way. Anyway, just didn't want you to worry if I'm not home when you get there. Tasha and I had been roommates for the past year, sharing a small apartment about 15 minutes from the hospital. It wasn't uncommon for one of us to get home before the other after a shift. Sounds good. Drive safe, I told her. See you soon. We hung up, and I continued on my usual route home, grateful to avoid any traffic delays. When I arrived at our apartment building about 20 minutes later, I was surprised to see that Tasha's car wasn't in its usual spot. I figured she must have hit some unexpected traffic on her alternate route. I headed up to our third floor apartment, unlocked the door, and flicked on the lights. The place was quiet and empty. I kicked off my shoes and headed straight for the shower, letting the hot water wash away the stress of the night. By the time I emerged from the bathroom in my pajamas, it was nearly 1 a.m. I frowned as I glanced at my phone, seeing no new messages from Tasha. She should have been home by now. I sent her a quick text, Hey, you home yet? Everything okay? I put her around the kitchen, making some tea while I waited for a response. After 15 minutes with no reply, I started to feel a knot of unease in my stomach. It wasn't like Tasha to be out of contact for this long, especially after a night shift when she knew I'd be waiting up. I tried calling her phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Now genuinely worried, I paced around the living room, debating what to do. Maybe her phone had died. Maybe she'd gotten a flat tire. There were plenty of innocent explanations, but as the minutes ticked by with no word from Tasha, my imagination started conjuring up worse scenarios. What if she'd gotten into an accident on that unfamiliar route? What if something had happened to her in that industrial area late at night? By 2 a.m., I couldn't stand it anymore. I called the police non-emergency line to report Tasha missing. The dispatcher took down all the information, Tasha's description, the route she said she was taking, the make and model of her car. They promised to send a patrol car to check the area, but said there wasn't much else they could do until she'd been missing for 24 hours. I hung up feeling frustrated and helpless. There had to be something more I could do. I decided to retrace Tasha's route myself, just in case her car had broken down somewhere along the way. I threw on some clothes and hurried down to my car. The streets were eerily empty as I drove towards the industrial area Tasha had mentioned. Row after row of dark warehouses and factories loomed on either side of the road. I crawled along at a snail's pace, peering down each side street and alley, searching for any sign of Tasha's silver Civic. My headlights swept across loading docks and chain-link fences, but there was no trace of her car. After an hour of fruitless searching, I reluctantly headed home hoping against hope that Tasha would be there when I arrived. But the apartment was just as empty as I'd left it. I spent the rest of the night making calls to the hospital to see if Tasha had gone back for some reason, to other friends and co-workers to see if anyone had heard from her. No one had any information. 
As dawn broke, I was sitting on the couch, bleary-eyed from lack of sleep, when my phone finally rang. My heart leapt, but it wasn't Tasha. It was a detective from the local police department. I'm calling about your missing friend, Tasha Martinez. Yes, have you found her? I asked anxiously. There was a pause on the other end of the line. I'm afraid not, the detective said gravely. But we did locate her vehicle abandoned in a vacant lot off Industrial Boulevard. There were signs of a struggle inside the car. I felt the blood drain from my face. Oh God, I whispered. What, what does that mean? Where is she? We don't know yet, Detective Herschel said, but I need you to come down to the station as soon as possible. We have some questions for you about Ms. Martinez's movements last night. In a daze, I agreed and hung up the phone. As I grabbed my keys to head to the police station, one thought kept running through my mind. If only I had insisted on picking Tasha up from work like I usually did. If only she hadn't decided to take that different route home. Little did I know, this was only the beginning of a nightmare that would consume the next several months of my life. The police station was a flurry of activity when I arrived. I was ushered into a small interview room where Detective Herschel was waiting for me. He was a tall man with salt and pepper hair and tired eyes that had clearly seen too much. Thank you for coming in, he said, gesturing for me to take a seat. I know this must be a difficult time for you. I nodded numbly, still struggling to process everything that was happening. Please, just tell me what you know. Where is Tasha? Detective Herschel sighed. I'm afraid we don't have many answers yet. Ms. Martinez's car was found abandoned in an empty lot about two miles from the hospital. The driver's side door was open and her purse and phone were still inside. There were signs of a struggle, some blood on the steering wheel and a broken nail on the floor. I felt sick to my stomach. Blood? Oh God, do you think she's... We don't know anything for certain yet, the detective said quickly. The amount of blood was small, consistent with a minor injury. Our forensics team is processing the car now for any evidence that might tell us what happened. He pulled out a notepad. Now I need you to walk me through everything you remember about last night. When was the last time you saw or spoke to Tasha? I recounted our brief phone conversation, Tasha's mention of taking a different route home, and my fruitless search of the area in the early morning hours. And you say this alternate route was unusual for her? Detective Herschel asked. I nodded. We almost always take the same way home from the hospital. I've never known her to cut through that industrial area before. The detective made some notes. Was there anything else unusual about her behavior recently? Any new people in her life? Any problems at work or in her personal life? I racked my brain, trying to think of anything out of the ordinary. Not really, I said slowly. She's been working a lot of overtime shifts lately, picking up extra hours whenever she can. But that's not too unusual for nurses. Detective Herschel nodded, jotting down a few more notes before closing his notebook. Thank you for your time. We'll be in touch if we need any further information. As I left the police station that day, I had no idea that it would be the last substantial update I'd ever receive about Tasha's case. The weeks turned into months and the months into years. Despite extensive searches, investigations, and public appeals, no trace of Tasha was ever found. The police eventually exhausted all leads. Tasha's car remained the only piece of physical evidence, offering no further clues beyond those initial signs of struggle. Her bank accounts went untouched, her phone never activated again. Theories abounded. Had she been a victim of foul play? Had she voluntarily disappeared to start a new life? Was she caught up in something dangerous that forced her to vanish? But none of these questions ever received definitive answers. Years after that fateful night, Tasha's case was officially classified as a cold case. Her parents, worn down by grief and uncertainty, eventually moved away from the area unable to bear the constant reminders of their missing daughter. As for me, I stayed at General, unable to bring myself to leave the last place I had shared with my best friend. Every time I walk past her old locker or drive down that industrial stretch of road, I'm hit with a fresh wave of memories and unanswered questions. I find myself hoping that my phone will ring and I'll hear Tasha's voice again, but it never does. The mystery of what happened to her that night remains unsolved. There are no answers, 
no closure. Some mysteries remain just that, mysteries. And all we can do is learn to live with the uncertainty, cherishing the memories of those we've lost while somehow finding the strength to move forward. It was late at night, and I was working the night shift at the call center. My name is Amanda. I've been at this job for about three years now, and while it's not the most exciting work, it pays the bills. The office is always quieter during the night shift. There's a small team of us, me, a few others, and our supervisor, Karen. I noticed something strange as I settled into my routine. One of my coworkers, Arlene, wasn't at her desk. Arlene is usually very punctual, and it was odd for her not to be here, especially without letting anyone know. I figured she might have had a personal emergency or something, but as the night went on, I started to get a little worried. The call center itself is in a large office building downtown. At night, the building is almost entirely empty, except for our team. The lights are dimmed, and the only sounds are the hum of computers and the occasional ring of a phone. It can get a bit eerie, but we're all used to it by now. Around midnight, I asked Karen if she had heard from Arlene. Karen looked a bit puzzled and said she hadn't. This was getting stranger by the minute. Arlene's car was in the parking lot, so she had to be somewhere nearby. I decided to take a quick break and see if I could find any clues about Arlene's whereabouts. Her desk was neat as usual, but her phone was missing. That struck me as odd because Arlene was always glued to her phone. Feeling uneasy, I texted Arlene, but there was no response. I went back to my desk and tried to focus on my work but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. By 2 a.m., I couldn't take it anymore. I told Karen I was going to check on Arlene at her apartment. Karen gave me a worried look but agreed. She promised to keep an eye on things while I was gone. Arlene lives just a few blocks from the office, so I decided to walk. The streets were deserted. As I approached Arlene's building, I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. Her apartment was on the ground floor, and as I got closer, I noticed that the door was slightly ajar. My heart raced as I pushed the door open. The apartment was dark, and the only light came from a lamp in the living room. I called out Arlene's name, but there was no response. The place was eerily quiet. I stepped inside, and my eyes slowly adjusted to the dim light. The living room was in disarray. Furniture was overturned, and there were papers scattered everywhere. I called out again, my voice trembling. Still no answer. I made my way to the bedroom, and that's when I saw it. The lock on the bedroom door was broken, and the door itself was hanging off its hinges. I pushed it open, my hands shaking. The room was a mess, and there was no sign of Arlene. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. My hands were shaking so badly that I almost dropped the phone. I told the operator what I had found, and they assured me that officers were on their way. I backed out of the apartment and waited outside, my heart pounding in my chest. It felt like hours before the police arrived, though it was probably only a few minutes. Two officers entered the apartment while I waited outside with a third officer. They were in there for what felt like an eternity before they came back out. One of the officers approached me and asked if I had touched anything. I shook my head, unable to speak. Later. The officer explained that they had found some disturbing evidence inside. There were strands of hair and some pieces of skin, but no sign of Arlene. They were treating it as a potential crime scene and would begin a full investigation immediately. I was in shock. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Arlene, my friend and co-worker, was missing, and it looked like something terrible had happened to her. The next few days were a blur. The police questioned all of us at the office but none of us had seen anything unusual. The investigation was ongoing, but there were no leads. Arlene was just gone, and the evidence they found in her apartment only raised more questions. To this day, Arlene is still missing. The police have no idea what happened to her, and her disappearance remains a mystery. Every time I walk past her empty desk at work, I feel a chill run down my spine. I can't stop thinking about that night. The image of her ransacked apartment haunts me. Arlene's disappearance has changed me. I used to feel safe in my apartment, but now every creak and shadow makes me jump. I've become paranoid, always looking over my shoulder, and I can't help but wonder if I'm next. 
I hope that one day we'll find out what happened to Arlene, but until then, I'll never forget the terror of that night and the mystery that remains unsolved. It was supposed to be a routine work trip. My colleagues and I were heading to Denver for a conference, and we decided to make a quick stopover in Colorado Springs for the night. The hotel we picked was a modest one, nothing fancy, but it seemed comfortable enough for a single night's stay. I was traveling with three of my co-workers, Liam, Noah, and Ethan. We had all been friends for years, having worked together on countless projects. However, there was a heaviness to this trip. Ethan had been going through a tough time. His girlfriend, Sophia, had passed away from cancer just a few weeks ago. We hoped this trip might provide some distraction for him, or at least a brief escape from his grief. After checking into the hotel, we decided to meet up in Noah's room for a bit of a catch-up. The mood was light, and we were reminiscing about old times when Ethan excused himself. I'm gonna get some fresh air, he said quietly. We all nodded, understanding he needed some space. Hours passed and Ethan hadn't returned. Initially, we didn't think much of it. Maybe he just needed some time alone. But as the night grew darker, a sense of unease settled over us. We tried calling his phone, but there was no answer. We checked the hotel's common areas, but he was nowhere to be found. Maybe he went for a walk and lost track of time, Noah suggested, trying to keep the mood calm. We should go look for him, Liam said, already heading for the door. We split up, each taking a different route around the hotel's perimeter. The cold night air bit into my skin as I walked through the deserted streets. There was an eerie silence, only occasionally broken by the distant sound of traffic. After what felt like hours of searching, I returned to the hotel lobby where Noah and Liam were waiting. Their expressions were grim. No sign of him, Liam said, frustration evident in his voice. We decided to contact the local police. Within half an hour, officers arrived and started asking questions, taking down Ethan's description and reassuring us they would do everything they could to find him. The hours ticked by slowly. We sat in the hotel lobby, a sense of dread hanging over us. It was around 3 a.m. when a police officer approached us, his face a mix of concern and something else I couldn't quite place. We found this near the hotel's back entrance, he said, holding up a small crumpled piece of paper. It's a note. My heart sank as he unfolded it and read aloud. I tried so hard. Can't take it anymore. Don't try to find me. It's too late. The room fell into a stunned silence. The weight of Ethan's words hit us like a ton of bricks. I could feel a lump forming in my throat, my mind racing with a thousand thoughts and none at all. Does this mean he... Noah couldn't finish his sentence, his voice breaking. We're still searching, the officer said gently. But given the note, we need to consider the possibility he may have harmed himself. The police continued their search throughout the night and into the next day, but Ethan was nowhere to be found. His note was the only clue, a chilling reminder of his pain and our helplessness to save him. We returned to our homes, the conference forgotten. Days turned into weeks and there was still no sign of Ethan. His disappearance became a haunting mystery, a shadow that loomed over us all. The note remained etched in my mind, its words a constant reminder of a friend lost to despair. Every now and then, I find myself thinking back to that night, replaying the events over and over in my head. Could we have done something differently? Could we have said or done something to help him? These questions remain unanswered, much like the mystery of Ethan's disappearance. His story serves as a grim reminder of the silent battles people face battles that can sometimes lead them to dark and desperate actions. I hope that wherever Ethan is, he's found some semblance of peace and that he knows he's deeply missed by those who cared for him. In the end, the pain of losing a friend in such a way is something that stays with you. It's a scar that never fully heals, a memory that never fades.